house. Um, so who's new here? I love seeing this. How cool is that, right? So I want to give you a very big hand for walking into a room full of people that you don't know, because it takes a lot of courage to do that. So one of the things that um, helps, I think, when you come into the room are those the bios, which I love to read because, first of all, I put on there, I ask you to put on where you live. And the reason for that is I want you to ask each other out at the end and go home with each other, okay? So, <laughs> so I want you to be able to share a cab, go on the subway together. So I just want you to raise your hand. Who's on the east side? Okay? So just kind of keep an eye out, look around, because when you're getting ready to leave, you know, think about it. Who's on the west side? Lots of west siders. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, uh, Brooklyn. Lots of Brooklyn in the house. Okay, and uh, okay, Queens. 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 Yes. All right. All right. So keep an eye on each other, and then downtown. Downtown. Okay, cool. We've got two hipsters right here. <laughs> I think of myself as being downtown here, and I was told by the youngsters, you're not downtown. No, you're not downtown. Anyway, okay, so that's the reason for the bios. But I just love looking through them, and this is two sides, so now you're going to see what I'm saying on the other side. But um, I just think that just to like, just like I summarize it, and I, and I just go through it, it's like we've got energy healers, we've got a lot of them in the house. Raise your hands. I mean, great. Yes. Uh, cancer survivors, we've got a minister, we've got, I mean, there's women from at least 10 different countries in this room. A mother of six, raise your hand, girlfriend. Give her some more wine, okay. We've got single moms, we've got fur baby moms, we've got fur babies, fur babies yes. We've got film, a film writer and producer, lots of them actually, founder of the Smutty Book Club. CFO of Planned Parenthood. Where are you? <laughs> Jen, Jen, who traveled to Croatia this spring. Okay, I need to speak to you because I'm going to Croatia. But these kinds of things you look at, and it's like, okay, Kristen, this is so far. So, Kristen Regan. Okay, so I met her sister on a plane. The sister lives okay. in Michigan. Wow. And she said, my sister lives in New York. I go, she has to be a wise and wonderful woman. Yeah. So, wait a minute. so she is here for the first time. So, yeah. anyway, here's the so and my friend Deb Kay, who just walked in the door. There you go. Perfectly on time, right there. Okay, so Deborah, I, I, she's one of my dearest friends. I have no idea how to pronounce her last name. So <laughs> <laughs> she runs Hearts of Gold, and Hearts of Gold is the organization that we are going to, in every meeting, bring clothes for. Men's and women's clothes. Okay. And how, what she does is support women and their children in the shelters of New York. And she does much more than that. That just kind of simplifies it. But she has a thrift shop that has new clothes and thrifted clothes for men and women that any of the proceeds from that go to the, her, her hearts of gold. So anyway, when you bring the clothes, we just bring them there. There's a, you'll get a donation slip. And so for any of you that brought them tonight, thank you. And if you want to speak to Deb more about her store or her wonderful organization, please do that over there. Um, so anyway, the um, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, on, your, on, your, uh, on your table, there's a card. So look at the card, okay. So, this is keeping in touch. There's a, there's a brand new Wise and Wonderful Women's Facebook page. I want you to look at that because all of the meetings that we do are filmed. So if you want to go back and you didn't remember something, if you want to send it to somebody that wasn't able to attend, but there's a lot of great, a lot of great stuff. Like somebody just recently called me about having an issue with elder care with the parent. And I said, you know, go back. And, and look at that, it was a great, great meeting. So they are on there and our future events are gonna be on there as well. So speaking of future events, that's on there um, here. Also, there's my Instagram and Facebook, okay? So if you wanna keep entertained, uh, just look, follow me on Instagram. Uh, so anyway, so 
Next, uh, next meeting is going to be, uh, we just said it, April 17th. And it's uh, with Dr. Lawrence, who is my plastic surgeon. I say my plastic surgeon, because I had, this is not, this is just, this didn't happen. <laughs> let's be honest, let's be honest. And I think it's just absolutely insane that people like pretend that they're not doing something. And you don't have to do anything. But if you want to do something, let's just be fucking real about it. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> anytime anytime somebody says something to me, I'm like, thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. But anyway, but, but he's, he's talking about invasive and non-invasive things. And there's things sometimes that you just don't feel good about. And I'm all about just feeling good. This isn't about looking 21. This is just about, you know, just if you have something that you thought you might feel better about. And then Gary Goldenberg is speaking about non-invasive. And it's just like also about melanomas. He's a very high, highly respected melanoma doctor. We all should be getting checked. And I'm also going to tell you that your dermatologist typically doesn't check your vagina and your gynecologist isn't checking your vagina for a melanoma, okay? You must have them check the same way that when you're going to get any kind of radiation at all, your breasts done, your teeth, anything. You gotta cover yourself up and the fact that they do not give you the collar that they have or the apron that they're wearing that will protect you is insane. So you've gotta advocate for yourself and you gotta get your private parts checked for melanoma. As a friend of mine, it didn't end well. Anyway, so Impact 100, okay? Impact 100, who's an Impact member? Because I don't think we, yes, we do, okay. So raise your hands a little bit higher, okay? So anybody that wants to learn a little bit more about Impact, please speak to these ladies, or you can go ahead and find this QR code. Impact 100, it, it's $1,000 a year. You don't have to do it every year. But it's impactful giving, and it's the power of collective donations. And then you, if you want to, you can be involved with choosing the nonprofits in the New York City area that we make $100,000 and $100,000 increments. There's about 350 of us in New York City now. It's a national organization. It's really, really awesome. You get to learn about so many nonprofits. And even if they don't win, you're learning about them and you might want to get involved with them. So anyway, that's what's on your, that's what's on there. Please take it with you. But what's also on there are being the um, real estate more than I am. They've got the Annie Gets It Done pads. But today we also have the Annie Gets It Done uh, uh, pens, but we're going to be doing a little bit more interactive um, meeting. Um, we originally came up with this uh, topic because Anna has spoken before, and we were talking about kind of mental health and the spiritual aspect of it, plant medicine, and kind of alternatives to just being medicated. Um, but then she reached out to me and she said that she had a wonderful speaker to suggest who's an oncologist, and she's a holistic oncologist. But when we were talking, we all of a sudden realized that it wasn't just so much about having this topic of like, how do you treat you know, cancer holistically or you know, your, the, the spiritual causes of, of illness, but we just thought it might be a little bit more interactive. So all of you are gonna need those pads and those pens, and when we ask you to divide up into groups, most of these tables are sevens, so you're gonna, you know, you're gonna go into twos or threes, okay? We don't wanna leave anybody out. Um, so anyway, let me introduce our speakers and let me see if there's anything else that I have to say. Okay, that is it, okay. So, um, Alex. Um, Sue, whoop, there we go, and I am Alex <laughs> Um So, uh, Alexandra Filimpovic. Is that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Medical oncologist uh, at the Imperial College of London. She is here from London. Flew in just for this. PH, uh, PH scientist in cancer cell biology, drug developer, head of oncology on Pure Tech Health Boston, whole, uh, whole health medicine clinician, practitioner, master coach, founder of Heal Clinic, the place where the whole body intelligence comes online. Come on up, girl. Okay, so Dr. Dr. Anna Usman um, is an internationally recognized, award-winning, board-certified. She's got so many accomplishments. She's awesome. Okay, anyways, <laughs> Stanford and Yale-educated 
mind, body, spirit, concierge, psychiatrist, and executive coach with a private practice in New York, California, Connecticut, and Florida. She's a best-selling author of Fulfilled, and when she spoke last time, we all got that book, and I really loved it. I want you to get out and buy it. It's great. Um, How the Science of Spirituality Can Help You Live a Happier, More Meaningful Life, and as a clinical assistant professor, also with Yale Medical School. Um, She is presently creating a mental health and spiritual center at Yale. How cool is that, that Yale is putting together mental health and spirituality? Clients include uh, Forbes, 500 C- Forbes 500 CEOs, Olympic athletes, A-list actors and actresses, and the chairs of academic departments at top universities. So everybody's getting with the program, but you are leading the way. Um, you have helped over 3,000 people achieve greater impact, purpose, and joy in their life and work. Come on up. <laughs> Like I said, we were going to kind of go down the road of how does how does emotions how you know how does it affect your health and we started down that. I want to speak a little bit to that, but then we started to go into something I we all thought was going to be a better direction. So why don't you why don't you start in terms of mm-hmm. yeah the medical proof of yeah, absolutely what's your, yes right so both um. Alex and I are a little bit outside of our paradigms in that we're traditional Western medical doctors trained in the traditional Western medical model, but both of us have decided that the Western model sometimes feels a little constraining. So in our perspective and the way that we practice, we've been a little bit more expansive in our views. For myself, what that's meant is adding spirituality into my understanding of mental health and psychiatry. And for Alex, she'll certainly speak in her way, but it's meant including numerous other factors as she helps people deal and heal with their cancer diagnoses. And so this is the direction that we are gonna go today and we're gonna talk about the three Bs we decided, boundaries, burdens, and burnout as it pertains to cancer. And we're gonna do some interactive exercises with you guys today and we're gonna entertain your questions, which we're super excited about. Hold on one second. Are you in, in the back? Do you, does anybody want to pull up a chair? If you feel like you can't hear us because we're not on a mic, do you want to? Does anybody want to come up? Okay. Why don't we just? Okay. Let's let's do that real quick. We have an extra chair here because it's Anna's chair. And, and like the bird of cancer. And Alex will talk about that. Actually, oncology. That word comes from burdens. <laughs> Boundaries, burdens, and burnout. Now, the funniest thing was I could not remember the third B, and I'm like, wait, burnout? And then, wait, I can't, I can't remember the easy one. Wait, no, but I couldn't remember boundaries because I don't have any. That was the problem. Perfect. I was like, so okay. There's a reason. Exactly. Sorry. Um, okay. So whoever wants, wanted to sit up front is sitting up front? No. Okay. All right. Got it. I think, Anna, you you started us off in a beautiful way, and similarly, for me, after years and years of practice, there came a day when I walked into my oncology clinic, after years of um, a personal healing journey, that really opened up a whole different way of being in the world. And that day, the office was the same, the waiting room was the same, but I, I was different. There was something that shifted in me. And what that looked like and felt like was I stood on the other end of so much trauma and I I went through so much healing and I was being held by a village of wonderful people. And I could feel a space in front of me and I knew that I was now ready to hold my patients in a different way that a prescription, a blood test, and a scan was simply no longer enough, and that from that moment onwards, I would be doing things differently. So were you talking to them more about what was going on with them emotionally in terms of helping them heal, or when you say holding on to them differently, how do you mean? So is that concept of holding space that can be considered really passive, but it's pretty much the the most active thing you can do for a person. What it looks like today is really, when, when someone walks in for a consultation, 
I see them as a whole person. It is no longer a tumor walking in that I need to treat. It's the whole person. So you've all come here this morning from all different parts of New York. And you woke up this morning and you got ready. You picked up the clothes that you're going to wear. And we do this every single morning. But there's something invisible that we take out with us when we leave our house each day. In addition to our clothes and our bags, we take with us our entire life history every single day. And that will inform our behavior, our choices, our reactions, ideally our responses, yeah. our boundaries, or lack of them, or lack of them. <laughs> <laughs> so really, it's the emotional piece yeah. that, that complemented everything else that I've been doing. Because the stat, you're great at talking about stats, because a lot of the times we're just talking about esoterically, and it's just like emotions and holding things in can make you sick, and if you have to mature, it's going to make you sick. But it's like, what's the data? It's making yeah. us sick. Yeah, there, there's a ton of data. And I mean, the data ultimately is that well, there's data in two ways. There's data as to what can make you sick and tons of data showing that suppressed emotions, poor coping skills, you know, obviously things we know, certain diets are not as super healthy, um, but that there's also amazing healing things that happen. Um, there's a uh, woman named Kelly Turner who wrote a book, Spontaneous Remissions, and she wrote about all the people who have had spontaneous remissions from often incurable stage four cancers. This happens. It's not a common occurrence, but it certainly happens. And what she realized is that the remissions in these people actually aren't spontaneous at all. These people have worked really, really hard, and she categorized what they've done into nine different categories. You know, so what is it? And then this was her dissertation work, but then became the basis of her life's work. And so I actually wrote down the areas because I thought people would want to know exactly what they are. And I will tell you. So if you want a spontaneous remission from a stage four cancer, and there's obviously no guarantees, but here is what you can do. Number one, a radical diet change. And she doesn't say exactly what the diet is. Some people maybe did a juice cleanse. Somebody became vegan. Somebody actually probably ate more protein. Whatever it was, it was a diet they believed in that aligned with what they needed. Number two, taking control of your health and deciding this is it. I'm going to do something about this and I'm going to do a lot of things. Number three, following your intuition. There's so much information that we get from the outside world, but there's also this quiet inner voice that's within us that if we fail to listen to it, we can miss the most important thing that we need, especially for our healing. Number four, herbs and supplements. That speaks for itself. Number five, increasing your positive emotions. And there's so many different ways to do that. We'll talk more about emotions. We have like a whole little teaching on emotions for today. Number six, embracing social support, which makes perfect sense. Number seven, deepening your spiritual connection. Number eight, releasing suppressed emotions. And number nine, having purpose, a strong reason to live. So as far as data, for someone who's devoted her life to studying spontaneous remissions, these are the nine things that lead to them. And I see that in clinic mm -hmm. yeah. all, all the time. And it's very interesting. I'll dovetail off of something that you said. Actually, two things to come to you mind. Just talk to them only, only because I know it's hard for them to hear. Of course, in the back. They of told course, me last time. Of, of course. <laughs> so, here's here's two points that I'd love to follow on from from Anna's share. It's the the re-empowering piece because if you if you take a look at all of those nine points, what do they have in common? It's you giving the power back to yourself. That's what's in common with all nine points. And sitting there as a physician, my key intention now is to re-empower the patient back. And we can do that in different ways. We can do that also by asking different questions. One of those questions being, what does healing mean to you? And we can pause for a moment. <coughs> Just set an intention to go inward, just for a second. If you have a headache, if you have a tense muscle, if your shoulders are a little tense, if there's anything else that you're aware of that you don't have to share but you know, what does healing mean to you? You have every right 
to not share the same concept of healing. And when it comes to a cancer patient, cure doesn't have to mean healing. Healing can come in so many different ways that are so beautiful. So that is one thing. And then the other thing is a healing round table. And it, it's mentioned in one of those points. So what is a healing round table? It's a table, just like that, a virtual table. And it's a great thing to do if you feel called after this event, just draw a dining room table, literally. It can be as big as or as small as you want around something that you're dealing with in your life. Who is sitting at your healing round table? Family members, brothers, sisters, parents, pets, children, doctors, what kind? Other people, who is there, who has shoved their way in there that you really don't want them there? Who is not supporting you and your empowerment? And that becomes a really beautiful exercise for you to curate your own healing round table. Right, because it doesn't have to be about illness, because I think the yeah. point of this is not becoming ill. It's about healing okay. and healing, you know, not taking care of that yes. very often leads to illness. Yeah. We taught, we, last, uh, last month we had a patient advocate here and we were talking about, you know, you might have a spouse or you might have your best friend and who's going to be that advocate? And the person that's closest to you might not be that advocate. So I think when you're thinking about that healing table, I think if you really think about the people that really support you in a way that's a healthy way, like there's always that friend that will call you and tell you to go out again with that guy that's no good or, you know, or stay out late or whatever, you know, whatever it is, there's always that, that, that friend that's trying to get you to eat something that's, you know, like if I'm trying not to drink as much, it's like, yeah, yeah, have a couple. So who are the people that really, really support you in a very positive and healthy way? I think that's, what you're saying Precisely. too, right? Yes. And, the, and the advocate at the doctor isn't necessarily going to be the spouse. They might not be that person that's going to be able to stand up. They might not be able to show up in a way that you're going to need. Yes. Precisely. Right. That's great. Yes. Yes. Um, so why don't we, why, do you want it? you know, one of the major things as women is that we take on a lot, mm -hmm. right? And maybe boundaries. I don't know because that was the B I was having a very hard time remembering. I kept blocking it out. What's another B word? I kept texting you. What is the other B word? I know it. So is there is there an exercise that we can start sure. with that you want? Sure. Let's talk about boundaries a little bit. And what are boundaries? How do you set them? So boundaries is the place where you end and another begins. All relationships are ultimately about boundaries. And the question of all relationships is, how close is too close and how far is too far? So in every relationship, there's constantly this delicate dance of getting a little bit closer, a little bit farther, and figuring out what the right distance is where you can still maintain your sense of self and yet still maintain closeness and intimacy with another. That is really the definition in many ways of a relationship. Now we remember good fences make good neighbors. So the better your boundaries, paradoxically, the closer you can actually get to people. Now, what does it mean to have the boundaries? Good boundaries means being in touch with yourself in real time to know how you're feeling and what you need and when you need to say no. We as women are programmed to say yes. We're excellent at saying yes to everybody, both people pleasers, to our families, to society, to our husbands, to our friends, right? So being able to say no and stand in your power in that and recognize that you are worthy of saying no. You're worthy of taking your space. You're worthy of setting your boundaries is often a paradigm shift for many people. Yes. And how, <laughs> and how does that tie into health? Yeah, it ties into health in a really, really beautiful and important way. Because at the end of the day, every no you say conserves your energy. And as you conserve your energy, you're a yes to so many other things. If you're saying yes to everybody, your energy is dispersed and you fail to remember who you are and what's most important to you and why you're even doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So the more no's you say, the more yeses you're actually able to say. That's the paradox. We think no's are dangerous. We're going to let people down. It's actually the opposite. The more no's you say, the more yeses you're able to say to what's truly important and who's truly important to you. And that's why it's so important to your health. Absolutely. Yeah. 
The whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we record it. <laughs> it's, it's probably also really interesting to remind ourselves that boundaries are not just something we speak out. Boundaries are energetic, boundaries are behavioral, boundaries are emotional. We get to have boundaries with time. We get to have boundaries with money. We get to have boundaries at work. We get to have boundaries with our children. And we get to express them in different ways. One of the ways is verbally, but other ways are even physically. Gently, this is my boundary. Energetically as well, and emotionally. And I will never in my life forget the day I realized I didn't have any boundaries. One of my first therapists in psychosynthesis set me down on the floor and gave me a piece of string. So that could be a really interesting exercise to do with a trusted person whenever you feel called after this event. Get a belt or a piece of string or a scarf, doesn't matter. Sit on the floor, let's cross, eyes closed. And she said, right, so imagine this is your boundary, and now where is it? If I was honest, I would have put it right here on my lap, but I felt really embarrassed, mm -hmm. so I put it just here. And she said, are you sure about that? And I'm like, oh, if you only knew, I wanted to put it here. <laughs> and then she started walking from across the room. I had my eyes closed. And I genuinely did not feel invaded. Literally, she probably could have sat on my lap. Mm -hmm. That's how porous my boundaries were. Now, how I see boundaries today, my own boundaries, is every single one of them is deeply rooted right here. And then they're so flexible. So boundaries are not walls. Remember that. Boundaries move. And you get to readjust them in real time with everybody, even with yourself, because we have boundaries with ourselves as well. So it's a, it's a beautiful piece, and it does deal to burdens, because if we don't have boundaries, and we don't know how to say no, then we accumulate burdens. Burdens, the other B. The other B. <laughs> um, what would you like for them to do on their pads, on their Andy Gets It Done pads? <laughs> <laughs> and write with their Andy Gets It Done pen. Uh, the, uh, what, uh, what are you thinking in terms of the yeah. Uh, yeah. So if you guys are open to it, could we have a three minute stream of consciousness exercise on the following question? In what parts of my life do I feel that my boundaries are perhaps too porous or lacking? In what part of my life would I like better boundaries? What keeps me from implementing that? Let's actually take five minutes. It's a big topic. And for people to really be able to go in and just to describe for you what a stream of consciousness writing. It's when you start writing and you don't lift your pen from the paper. You just keep writing and writing and writing. Stop thinking and let everything come through you. And so to write in that way without any filters. Are they going to share it afterwards? Um, you could, we might have a, a few people share if they so choose, but it's really personal for yourself. So please write it more for yourself. It's more a form of self-inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got you on a timer. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Mm -hmm. Actually, gave you the word. Perfect. That's perfect. Yes. I'm writing it down, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. 
that that was the deal for him to hunt exactly. And writing is such a broad, broad topic. There's so many ways of thinking about writing together. Yeah. We've got one more minute. <laughs> Remember, boundaries can be fun as well, so have fun with it too. <laughs> Elaborate on that one. <laughs> Okay, we're going to have two people share um, as you finish up. Who wants to raise their hand and we'll, would, uh, would like to share? And if you don't, it's totally fine. You've got boundaries. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Say your name, sweetheart. Hi, I'm Nadine Ross. I'm from Rockford, and I work with Uh, as far as boundaries, uh, I put down uh, personal and work, but with personal, I put down uh, like my friends and family and parents and, and, and friends. And I say this because I come from a very a Middle Eastern background, so we have no boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it has, you know, uh, creates, um, uh, it creates not only anxiousness and it creates um, you know I feel that sometimes I'm always like I'm too available for everyone and it's in case like if I miss my parents call some you know it's already programmed that something wrong with, if I miss their call or I don't you're dead uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it's wrong. and uh, I've learned to at some point tell everyone uh, to call me during business hours only now, because I've got East Coast, I've got regular calls, and, and people wanting my time. So I say, please contact me between my business hours. Like, so I say 9 to 6. So I have the evenings and I have earlier in the morning to, you know, my, to not only myself and my time, but I feel like in the early mornings, uh, when I'm too available to everyone and call everything going on, that I can't create what I have to create and set my intention for what I want to create during the day. That's right. Good. Good. That's a, that's a huge step. Um, we have one in the back. Is that chat? No. Yep. Step, stand up. So, um, I have a problem with boundaries when it comes to my kids and family. I used to be one who had a lot of boundaries with them, but it really stems from the guilt that I have like after my mom passed. Uh, so I used to, uh, when she moved to Long Island and she used to ask me for a bunch of stuff, I used to do some and then I'm like, no, you know what, I'm working uh, or I'm doing this. So the moment that she passed away and then my dad passed after, I, the guilt always comes when I say no. So I know how to say no. But then I'm, I'll call them and I say, okay, okay. <laughs> because I'm so scared that something's gonna happen to them that the last thing that I remember is me saying no to something so simple. Yeah. 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 That, that's a really beautiful, both chairs are really, really beautiful and thank you for your courage and your vulnerability. Um, to stand up and share them with us. And I'm sure that a lot of the similar boundaries are shared in the room. Um, you're, trust me, you're not alone. I can raise my hands, both of those, both my hands, actually. And 
it's simple and it's not, which is what I wanted to speak to very quickly. The reason I say it's simple is because, well, yeah, it seems simple. Um, I should be able to say no, but I'm not. But why is it not simple? It's because to heal and to move forward, let's use an analogy of a bow and arrow. So the arrow is going to move very quickly forwards. For that arrow to gain momentum and speed, what happens? You pull it backwards and then you release it. So that moment of addressing or, or reflecting on where we came from, on our childhood, on our bringing up, on how our nervous systems developed, has a purpose. It doesn't mean you stay there, it just means you visit it and you get to learn to hold it in a different way because that young girl learned and it got imprinted that it's not okay to say no. It was a matter of life or death at one point. Today it's not, but we have to reprogram that part of our brain and we're so lucky because our nervous systems can be reprogrammed and we can build new pathways and new ways and they can become the highways and so that arrow then goes really, really fast forwards and the healing becomes a lifestyle. But isn't it also about if you haven't really processed the grief or if someone dies suddenly, that it, it's, it's, it's sitting there and it comes out of fear, right? I um, did a program this summer and uh, I, I, it, was, it came out of nowhere. I had women shaman, I went down and drank ayahuasca in Costa Rica. And um, there were a bunch of women that grabbed me and I, I didn't even realize this. And they were like, your womb needs healing. And I'm like, my womb, my room, my what? And so, and it was because I had had a bunch of miscarriages. And then when my daughter was born, she almost died. And I hadn't processed that. And so what happens is that every time they would walk out the door at 24, I'm saying, make good choices. You know, be careful instead of have a great time because I still was, it's this trauma that I haven't dealt with and it was something's going to happen to them. So that's what I was thinking when you were saying, I used to be able to, it's I'm afraid they're going to die. I'm afraid something's going to happen and I'm going to be living with this guilt, this burden, this, you know, but, but I think it's all about that unhealed trauma because that is trauma right so, absolutely yes i i fully concur with that and i think that for so many physical illnesses there's a strong trauma component and what does that mean strong trauma component mm -hmm. it could be things having happened that we didn't metabolize or process such as grief or hardship it can also be other things that lead to very difficult emotions that we as human beings haven't really had the tools or capacity to process we're not really taught how to process difficult emotions. And so I want to give you a little model for processing difficult emotions and a great book reference for that. Um, and that is Letting Go by David Hawkins. How many people have heard of this book? Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And, uh, Letting Go by David Hawkins. He's an MD, PhD psychiatrist, but he also is, um, he wrote Power Versus Force, so many books that are just very elevated and expansive. And he talks about the five ways that we as humans can actually process emotions when they come up, four of which are good and important, and one of which is the best, which is letting go, which I'll tell you about. So the first way when a difficult emotion comes up is expression. We go talk to someone about it. I'm feeling sad, I go talk to my therapist or my friend or my husband or whoever. That's number one, expression. Number two is suppression. A difficult emotion comes up and I don't want to feel it. And I consciously choose, I'm not going to feel this feeling now. I'm going to put it aside, go do what I have to do, and later I'm going to feel it. Fine, that works, perfectly healthy. Number three is similar to suppression, but repression, meaning that it's not a conscious choice anymore to suppress this emotion. An emotion comes up, but the anxiety of feeling that emotion fully is so great that I don't even make a choice. I repress it immediately. And repressed emotions, what you don't own owns you. And it comes out in other unanticipated ways. I might then yell at my children, or I might then speak you know, to somebody else in a way that's inappropriate or 
it can come out in those ways. So expression, repression, suppression, then escape. I have a difficult emotion. I don't want to feel this emotion. It's hard to feel it. So I might escape by having some alcohol, by going to work, by exercising, all kinds of escapes, some more constructive, some more destructive. <laughs> So all of these ways are powerful and important ways of processing negative emotions, but the most powerful, and according to David Hawkins, which I agree with, is actually letting go. And what that means is letting your emotions fully run their course. So you have a difficult emotion, and you let it in without any judgment, meaning you don't pull the emotion in and you don't push it out. You let the emotion take its course and you feel it. You feel it in your body, you feel it in your heart, wherever it is. You cry if you need to cry, you feel what you need to feel, and then you let it run its own iteration, and you make the choice to let go. And you do that every time this emotion comes. You let it run its course and then let go. And that's actually the most powerful way of starting to process your emotions. And I wanna say an important thing about that because sometimes our emotions are tied to our thoughts, and we have certain stories that are tied to certain emotions. When you let go, you want to completely not focus on your thoughts. You only want to focus on the emotion that's created. Because you can actually have 80 million thoughts, but it just boils down to one emotion. And actually, too many thoughts keeps you from effectively processing your emotions. So that's a little tutorial. How do we work with difficult emotions? Yeah. And if that story of the emotions have the beginning, the middle, and the end, and it beautifully ties in with burdens <coughs> and with burnout, with the other two Bs. Now, why is that? If you if you look at an emotion like a string that runs its course, an event that got you to a, an emotional state may be over. It may be done, but you're not done. So is that question, is it done? And then the question is, am I done? And if you're not done, then give yourself that time and typically, most of our emotions, when they start rising up, they will run their course, many of them, in around 90 seconds. Some of them in around 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Maybe some of them will take longer, but many of them will, will run themselves through your body in about 90 seconds. And it's a muscle that you get to develop like anything else. It's a practice. It's not a one and done. It's a practice of allowing. And sometimes it will be messy, and that's OK. And other times you'll nail it, and that's great. But you got to give yourself that generosity and grace to start, even if it's there's no right or wrong. Just start. The other thing that's really important, you've mentioned story. Mm -hmm. And that sort of brings me to stories, language, words that we use to tell our stories. How incredibly important that is. And that is really connected to the burdens piece that we brought here today. Why? As an oncologist, if you can imagine, I've been doing this work for about two decades. And that's not the can you imagine part, but can you imagine <laughs> that only Two years ago, I realized that the word oncology comes from Greek, yes, but onkos actually means burden. Onkos means burden. So what does that tell, tell us about cancer and about oncology? And imagine this. If I told you guys the word COVID in 2018, would that have meant anything to any one of you? No. no? No, just a word, right? Just like any word, there's no emotional charge, there's nothing attached to it. How about if I tell you COVID today? Yeah, I'm seeing some nods, yeah, yeah. How about when we hear cancer? There's a lot of emotional charge there. And then we have stories saying, my cancer, my arthritis, my multiple sclerosis, my this, my that. If we only begin with awareness of the language, no judgment, crucial piece that, that Anna said, right? The first step, no judgment, let them come without judgment. 
just noticing as the days go by, what's the story I'm telling myself? What are the words that I'm choosing to use? And how can I unchoose that word and use another word? Try it on for size. Try it on for size, yeah? You mentioned the book, Power Versus Force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two different things. Power is actually beautifully grounded and calm. It comes from conviction, it comes from knowing. Other words, control versus mastery. How many times do we judge ourselves? Oh, I'm a control freak. How about we start to rephrase that? I want to be in mastery of. Those simple, powerful changes can really start affecting your body because emotions have a biochemistry and they have a physiology. How many of you know what it's like when your throat gets dry? Yeah? When your cheeks get flushed? Yeah? Mine are a little flush now. Yeah? When your heart beats faster, when your palms get sweaty, when you get cold. Yeah? Emotions. Emotions. They have physiology, they have biochemistry. So how can they not be linked to diseases? What are the stats? There are, there are, I know, because you're the queen of stats. Mm -hmm. When, when people are saying, I, I just want to talk about like fixing, I'm, I'm sick and I want to take a I want to take a medicine, I want to take a drug to fix it. You know, the, 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 the core is often based in, in what's going on in your body, right? So speak to some of that because obviously you're working with a center to, you know, talking about spirituality, talking about mental health tying it in with, 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 with medicine and, and, and healing all around. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what, yeah. what, <laughs> speak to that, sorry. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's tons of statistics. This is so beautiful. It's just showing what an important topic this is. So thank you and thank exactly. you for that little intro. <laughs> okay, so um, the stats, okay. So my particular interest area is on spirituality and mental health. And there is a lot of that as it applies to cancer. For instance, it's been shown that individuals who have some sort of spiritual commitment and have cancer have better prognosis in their cancer and better quality of life, which is very interesting, right? There's other things within mental health. Actually, going to church weekly reduces suicide, and it reduces it by a lot. It's a very real effect. So there's things like this. This is spirituality. There's a lot of things also with emotional processing. Alex sent me an amazing article recently about how within cancer have, and we actually are working with somebody right now who is specializing in cancer patients going through the process of identifying their emotional triggers and unearthing them and having a concerted, concentrated uh, three month process for this, how that really, really helps their mental well-being and probably therefore also their cancer. So there's an article she just sent me about this. Tons of emotional factors healthy processing emotions, increasing emotional positivity, all of which help a lot with, you know, if it, and, and the thing is, you know, the statistics, if it helps your mental health, it can't not help your physical health. They're the two are so connected, they're one and the same. Sometimes we think that the mind and body are separate, but the mind impacts the body, the body impacts the mind. There's this very strong bi-directional relationship. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Who has, uh, who watched uh, Living to 100, The Blue Zones? Mm -hmm. Okay, every mm -hmm. single group, I talk about this. Yeah. You must watch it. If you haven't watched it, you must. But they talk yes. about having sense of purpose, yes. sense of yes. community, yes. spiritual yes. path, eating eating more plant-based diet. Um, and then also you are where you eat. Um, watch it. It's very important. Yeah, and, and incidentally with that, um, having some sort of spiritual commitment, which of the centenarians, the 100-year-olds that were studied, Almost all of them went to uh, faith-based service of different denominations at least once a week, and they calculated that that added 10 to 14 years to their life over the course of their 100 years. That's a lot of years. Yeah. Um, do you want to do another little? We would love to. Yes. 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 What do you think? Mm -hmm. So we have another exercise. Now this is going to be interactive. The first exercise, we wanted you guys to go in and to have some discourse with yourself. Now we'd like you to have a discourse with your neighbor. And so we'd like you to get into groups of twos or threes 
And we're going to ask the question because so often it's easy to be next to the person that you're near and have a mask. Right? We all have masks. It's just how we are to the world. And so this is to enable you to get to know each other a little bit better and maybe to get to know yourself a little bit better. And so the question that one of you is going to start, so the person who's going to start is the person with the shorter hair. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that took that much. Yes. There you go. Good job. <laughs> Are they, uh, sorry, it's the whole table? No, um, it's groups of two, two or three, three okay, that right. you're going to get at, at your table. Right. And the question that you're going to discuss or that you're going to respond to is, if you really knew me, you would know this. <laughs> if you really knew me, you would know this about me. She's starting first. She's starting first. I see the short hair. No getting around it.
person or two share what your experience of that was like for you? Yes. It made me feel more reserved that the that the two strangers that I just met and shared and that feelings with. That's true. beautiful. Isn't it amazing to share like your innermost feelings with someone you don't even know? It's yeah, it's an amazing and then you see your shared humanity. It's really beautiful. Thank you. So thank you. Um so Patty and I have known each other for like forty years. <laughs> <laughs> We're in high school together in California. Yeah. Beautiful. And this just shows how multi-layered, right? And then within all of us, there's a mystery. Sometimes we think we know someone so well, even our spouse, we think we know them so, so well. But then sometimes, you know, you can find out, oh, wow, I would never have that. I never would even imagine. So it's really about having these opportunities to go even deeper and rediscover things about each other. So thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. Uh, I, I had these two <laughs> oh wait, we have virgins in the up, we also have virgins here, so it was like virgins and threesomes and stuff. That's right. You know, this is this can be the loneliest place in the world with eight plus million people. And I think it's important to realize to, to realize that we are so much alike, much more so than we're different. So I think that that's beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Alita, 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 Alita. Queen Alita. Hello. Thank you. So this is really magical because I felt like Tara and I were just galloping through the uh, different dimensions, like we were just like we were different things, and it was great. It was fun. We had a lot of fun. We did. Yeah. yeah. A lot of. Um, I share with the group. Yeah, I, I'm seeing projections now of energy fields. And so I saw her in a tree house. And sure enough, she loves to hug trees. <laughs> and I watched like the tree house show because I'm going to have one one day. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Is there one on like HGTV? There's a show. Stop it. No, stop it. They are luxury tree house. Yeah, I would imagine. I would imagine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh that's all. Not for the seven year olds. We've got one more person in the middle. Just, just stand up, honey. Just stand up. Thank you. I think the social media monster has made us all a little jaded of what you're allowed to say or not allowed to say, and what you're like supposed to type or what you can even say to someone sitting next to you. So personally, like then suddenly saying some something to somebody next to me that I don't know, I think twice. Where I think years ago I wouldn't now. You know, it's like yeah, I. I'm pretty, I'm pretty open, <laughs> and, um, and you know, my mouth used to run like water, but now, like, for, for years now, it's to, to, like, wait, can I really say that? Should I say that? Am I allowed to, is that going to come back at me? Is that going to, and I felt myself, like, thinking about, like, it took me too, it took me too long to think about what I was just going to say to another person. Mm -hmm. yeah. that mm -hmm. Is that, is that just getting, is that in some ways getting old? Like, I just sometimes think, don't want to be jaded, but then you have a certain amount of experience that would kind of lean you towards the other way. Like, I don't know, I just, I see children as being so innocent and then like getting away from that. But then also when I feel like I'm older, I just say whatever the hell I want to say and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. I thought I knew that yes. you were actually to say whatever the hell I wanted to say and now I'm worried about being canceled or maybe, yeah. am I supposed to say this or is this supposed something I'm supposed to share? It's right. going to get me in trouble. And, mm -hmm. right. you know, those and, and here's the thing, though. This is a safe space. Yeah. But vulnerability is earned. Right? Not everyone deserves your vulnerability. Not everyone deserves trust. That's earned. So that, that cautious part is there for a reason. And then there's the discerning part that gets to inform, right, this is a safe person, this is a safe space I can share. Yeah. And do you know what's really interesting, because I'm 76 now? Queen, <laughs> yes, queen. <laughs> had, had her twins at 57. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. And I'm in this, and I, you know, I help my brother form the guardian angel, 
angels, I've been in the streets, I've been, you know, rock bands, everything, meet in the air. Energy healer, I, you'd think that I would have good spot, right? But I hit 76 and I don't care what I say. <laughs> I, get on, I get on the stage, I'm, you know, doing my thing, singing, dancing, healing, blah, blah, blah. But it's such a freedom when you don't give up S-H-I-T about what anybody thinks. I, I can't, and if something happened, and it's not like I was always like cautious, I've never been cautious, but man, I feel like I'm taking off like a rocket ship. Okay, so in July, I'm not going to say anything about the vax, but I got the whole vax, and it brings out breast cancer. So I got breast cancer. But I was very happy. I was the only one that was back. I to say I went into the hospital and everybody's a little depressed. Right? <laughs> not, not me. <laughs> because I was going to get breast implant, you know, changing the breast kind of thing. Because I had breast implant because I was with a bodybuilder <laughs> when I was, no, 40. And he said, you know, you need to really get some breast implants if you want to do bodybuilding. So I did. So anyway, so I went in and said, I don't you realize you have to change your breast implants every 10 years? I didn't. Now I'm 75, right? So anyway, I was all excited. They took the thing out. They changed the breast, which was really nice, you know, because they really needed to be changed. But I was not depressed at all. And they were really, yeah, not at all. And the guy, the, the plastic surgeon said to me, uh, I think I'll give you C's. I said, I, I was in a C when I was 12. <laughs> I said, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> so they were laughing in the OR. Because when I was under the anesthesia, I could feel it. They were laughing and they were rooting for me. You know? <laughs> She's not dead. She's 75. She's not dead. So, but anyway, it's like you're, I was so happy that I went to Costa Rica. I didn't go to Costa Rica. I went to Mexico. I didn't do the chemo or the radiation because I, I didn't want my body burned at that time, but, but I didn't have stage four. I had, you know, mm -hmm. something that was not all that aggressive at all. It was non aggressive cancer. And now I feel like I've regenerated myself because I've done a whole detoxes for cancer. I'm going to live to 120. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> to share a quote or there was something you were going to start with but yeah. 
Yeah, Go ahead, sure. a beautiful closing quote. Yes. Which Alex is going to share. Well, first, I really want to thank you all for coming and for, for choosing to say yes to this because it may have meant to say no to something else. <laughs> what I feel you said yes to was yourselves. So thank you for that and thank you for trusting us and being here. Thank you, and for hosting us. And Adam. I met this beautiful woman only a couple of months ago, and, and this turned into a beautiful friendship. And um, what I really value is the path we walk on together um, and really sharing the same message. And I hope more of us come out to share this message, which is, you know, if you think about um, moving away from this concept of disease and perhaps saying that there is something that you're experiencing in this moment in time rather than I have a disease but then orienting ourselves towards what what do we typically tend to do not always but often imagine that that something you're going through is a house that's on fire it caught fire and there is a fire brigade, and there's a fire alarm that's going, informing you that there is a fire. Now imagine a fire brigade coming and pointing the hose into the fire alarm. Yeah. Hmm. Very often, that's what we do. Now, today's topic was integrating medical care with holistic medicine, and there is a space for both. So I really want us to go away with that message. There is a space for both. Medical care is there for a reason, and it has brought us a lot of good. And it's not an either or, it's a both and. Let's get another hose for that house that has caught on fire. And that can be our emotional well-being and really taking care of ourselves internally. You all have such enormous power within you, not force, but power. You have truth that you were born with. You have your birthright to live it. And with that, I'd like to share a quote that means a lot to me and that I often go back to when I need a reminder. And that is, and for those of you who want to hear this quote with your eyes closed, feel free to, or with your eyes open, whatever feels good. A woman is wise. She has earned her serenity, not having had it bestowed on her, but having passed her tests. She has suffered and grown more beautiful because of it. She has proven she can hold her kingdom together. She has become its vision. She cares deeply about something greater than herself. She rules with authentic power. You rule with authentic power. Thank you. We have about three questions. We have three minutes. We have three minutes, and then Alex and I will be here to answer questions individually. Anybody have any quick questions? Okay. You got you get you choose. It's Down. for both of you. So I guess um, just I guess for everybody and for myself, um, I would like to know what is it that you find? You know, you said to allow yourself to feel the feeling, right? So what would you say most people feel when it comes to allowing themselves to feel? Great question. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna um, uh, paraphrase the question. When you allow yourself to feel, what actually are you feeling? Yes. And so the answer to that question is: if you think about all the human emotions that we feel, usually they can be categorized into four primary emotions: sad, mad, glad, afraid. Every other emotion boils down to those. And so whenever and there's you know many nuances of them. There's tons of emotions but they all come down to those. And so as you think about what is it that I'm feeling, you go in, am I feeling angry? Am I feeling scared? Or am I feeling sad? And so it's usually one of those. And when you figure out what it is, you're like, where in my body do I feel it? And 
And then you also start to look, what's the story that's attached to it? Like you see not only the emotions, but the thoughts, because usually there's a ton of stories, right? And as Alex said, ultimately it's about retelling our stories. Mm -hmm. And like we're all narratologists. So we're figuring out what stories served us and serve us and which ones no longer do. And we create more constructive narratives. So, so I'm just saying, and in in what I do is that I find that people are really just afraid. They're so afraid of allowing themselves to feel the emotion. So yeah. that's why I was asking. I just Absolutely. want to you know, really speak to the yeah. fact that it's OK to feel the emotions. I don't Absolutely. think we were ever taught to be OK yes. with it, because we feel like we're going to get stuck in it. You know, yes. That's what I find with a lot of people, is that yes. they're like so afraid. And usually, you're not stuck in the emotion. You're stuck in the story. Right. So if you're able to disentangle your emotion from the story, it changes everything. Right. The emotion processes through. Yeah. And then the story you no longer have to attach to. Yeah. Thank you, Daphna. Great question. Mm -hmm. um, as a daughter, my um, my mother is very, very spiritual. I mean, she rode her bike across America. She did Gethsemane, went from Paris to Santiago. She's 84, and um, she's in the beginning of a journey uh, with colon cancer. And we don't know the stage yet because we haven't had the PET scan, but we know it's at least a three, probably a four. And I'm, I just got back, and thank you for last one, the last session because it got me in touch with the lawyer and uh, her elder care. And she's, she can't hear, and she's in denial, and my dad's 89. I'm going back for Easter. How do I, I, don't, I think she's in denial, and she's in the re, physical rehab because she has the, the bag right now, and, and she has to get strong enough to do the chemo and the radiation. Okay. How do I talk to my mom? Because I don't think that it's set in, yeah. don't, the enormity of it, and I'm trying to do their affairs, and, their, and my sister's a breast cancer survivor. Thank God I have her, and the two of us are together. But we're trying to stay optimistic, but I want to give her the space, but I don't think she really realizes what, and she's not the same person she normally is. It's like she's a, di a different person. Yeah. And so I just, I, I talked to her. Yeah. Is it okay if I sit there?
Alex, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and and and, and I want you to be able to sit. Anna also is here for any questions. But I just want to say also, I know we always want to fix it for the people that we love. And I think the most important thing is for you to have an open heart. And when you were talking about healing, when there's an illness, you can think about the bad things, but there's an incredible gift when someone is dying and just to be able to love them and feel that love and, and the fear of the loss. So we've all been there, but. My heart goes out to you. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you for coming.